show of hands. Wow, a good number of, of you. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking he sounds much taller on the radio, aren't you? <laughs> Do any of you ever listen to the Right Here, Right Now program? Yeah. Awesome, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I see some familiar faces from uh, previous events. And so glad that those of you who have been with us this evening, and certainly this is a topic that touches all of us as Catholics, but in another way, it also touches our family and friends, partly in the case of those who have left the church and maybe you're wondering, how can I help my family and friends come back to the sacraments? Maybe, maybe some of you have raised your children Catholic only to see them leave the church when they got into high school or college or when they got out of college and just drifted away from the church. I would have to guess there are some of you moms and dads here tonight whose children no longer receive the sacraments. And maybe now your own grandchildren are not being baptized or they're not being uh, given their first Holy communion or being confirmed. And so or if it's your own personal <laughs> desire to, to grow in your knowledge of the sacraments and how you can explain them to other people as well as live them out more fruitfully in your own life, that's what I'm here to talk about. And the title of the, the talk tonight is called Brought to My Senses. Now the reason I chose that title, there's a twofold reason. The first is that I myself grew up Catholic. I was born in LA. I know it's a totally different world in Southern California than up here, but that's where I grew up. I have deep family roots in the state of California, which is one reason why I always love coming back home. And, and as I was growing up, I was taught by my parents, baptized. And I believed all these things, as chances are you did too when you were little. And those of you who were raised Catholic like I was, chances are when you were four, five, six, seven, eight years old, like I, you never demanded biblical proof from your parents. You know, when you were five years old and your mom was teaching you about Jesus and the Eucharist, you probably didn't say, well, Mom, I'm not going to believe that unless you can prove it to me from the Bible. I never did that. There are proofs to these doctrines, and we will touch upon some of those as we go along this evening. But primarily what I'd like to do is to approach the subject of the sacraments as if we were learning about them for the very first time. Because after all, when we have the knowledge that we're given as infants and little children, and then we get a little bit older, that knowledge of the sacraments that our parents and grandparents gave to us, that's good up to a point. But if it doesn't become really something that we understand and believe for ourselves, it won't do a lot of good, let's put it that way. And maybe there are people in your own families, the ones I was describing before, who never really made that connection between the childlike faith they once had, believing in these teachings when they were kids, and then when they began to encounter resistance or opposition or even hostility from people who don't agree with the Catholic Church, maybe they were never able to make that transition from the childlike faith to a more adult faith. So as we talk about being brought to our senses, it's partly for that reason that we want to kind of wake up to the fact that the Eucharist, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, and all the other sacraments, they are great gifts given to us by God for our own salvation and for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. I think it's, it's fair to say that there are many Catholics who need to be woken up, don't you? They need to be brought to their senses, kind of uh, given smelling salts. Hey, wake up, look what you've got. Look at this great gift you have. I don't know who said it first, but I believe it's true that we Catholics in the 21st century are very much like beggars living on top of Fort Knox. We're like beggars living on top of Fort Knox, which means if you're living on top of Fort Knox, if you've got the keys to the treasure room where all the gold is, and yet you continue to live like somebody who doesn't have any food or anywhere to live or anything like that, in a way it's kind of almost your own fault. Because if you simply took the key and opened the door and walked in, all of those things that God desires for you are there waiting for you. Now I'm saying this present company excluded. 
I realize that you are the cream of the crop. I understand that. I know that you're believers. I know that you're trying to live out your, your Catholic faith according to the lights that God gives you. I understand all that. But all of us has to go home and share the truth with others. So that's the first reason. Being brought to our senses, waking up to this reality of the gifts that we've been given. The second reason I chose this title is because I believe that if we don't understand the physical dimension of who we are as human beings, then we will not be able to understand what the sacraments are, what they are and what they do. Here's what I mean. There was a heresy in the early church known as Gnosticism. And it was a heresy that took a variety of different forms, but among them was a consistency in which Gnostic heretics, who many of them actually fancied themselves to be Christian, but yet they were heretical in this regard, is that they regarded material things to be evil. And they had a notion that there was a good God who was responsible for the spirit world, and there was an evil God who was responsible for the material world. So in the material world, all the things that we don't like, like war, and earthquakes, and tidal waves, and headaches, and toothaches, and cancer, and car accidents, and broken legs, and all those things that we can look at in the world around us and say, that causes me pain, or that ruins a happy life. Those are all physical things, and so the Gnostics said that physical things are evil. And the church had to fight very hard to combat this heresy. I know some of you have seen that wonderful new movie about St. Augustine called Restless Hearts. St. Augustine was a profound uh, light of truth in an era when Gnosticism was gaining ground. The Manichaean heresy was one of the heresies that he himself actually fell prey to for a while. And he thought that Manichaeism, which was a, a, a variation of the Gnostic heresy, he thought that this was actually uh, the truth until eventually he met the founder, the main guy in the Manichaean heresy, and had an opportunity to talk to him. And you realize this guy is an empty head. He does not know what he's talking about. He does not have the truth. And that sent St. Augustine on the path of pursuing what is true. But St. Augustine had to fight against this notion that matter is evil. Now, here's, here's the way that can play out with regard to the sacraments. The sacraments, as you all know, have certain matter. And the matter can be everything from bread and wine for the Eucharist, or water for baptism, or the, the very bodies of the spouses, what we consider aspects of the sacrament of holy matrimony. Oil. All these different things are material. And part of the Gnostic heresy was to look upon these things with suspicion and to believe that not only can material things like bread and wine and oil and water and these other material constituent elements, not only could these things not do anything for us spiritually, but also that we were really simply souls trapped in bodies. And Sting, remember you know the, the singer Sting? He had an album, I really like this album as a matter of fact, it came out in the 90s, it's called The Soul Cages. And that's a, a title reminiscent of this notion of the Gnostic heresy, that we are encaged, so to speak, as spirits trapped. There's another one of the songs, spirits trapped in the material world. But we're really not, and this is the essence of the Catholic Church's teaching on the sacraments, that the Lord comes to us through our senses. Let's take, for example, Jesus himself. Jesus, I suppose, could have just simply appeared in the heavens. He could have just been there in the sky in some huge overpowering vision that everyone on earth could have just seen him and maybe heard his voice or something. But even those things would have been sensible, right? They would have been using the sense of sight or the sense of hearing. But Jesus transcended even that type of limited connection. And he became flesh. They were able to touch him. They could hug him. They could cry on his shoulder. 
Mary Magdalene could weep at his feet and dry his feet with her hair as she cried tears of repentance. The apostles could see Jesus physically healing people. They saw him, for example, take dirt and mix it with his own spittle to make mud to heal blind men. We see this repeatedly throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, that the Lord wanted to show us, I believe, that our senses, our bodily dimension, is very important to God. And if we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, we see that when God created Adam and Eve, He created them in body and soul. We see the story about how God fashioned Adam's body from the clay of the earth, and He breathed into the nostrils of this man-like form, however we can understand that. He breathed into that lifeless hulk of material his own life and therefore ensouled this body now so we now have a living, breathing human being. So, contrary to what the Manichaean heretics would say, we are not spirits trapped in a body. We are created by God as body and spirit. We are truly human when our souls and our bodies are united. And that's probably the best starting point for considering the sacraments. As I say, I really believe that if one does not understand this unity between the soul and the body, it becomes very difficult to understand how God can operate through things like the sacraments. So that's in the second sense that I mean being brought to our senses. God literally comes to us through our sense of sight and touch and taste, all these bodily aspects that we experience. I'm old enough to remember, and I think some of you may also be, uh, but I'm old enough to remember the Baltimore Catechism. I know some of you who are not quite so old, maybe a little less gray in your hair, or you're, you're uh, maybe still in high school or college, you probably don't remember the Baltimore Catechism unless your parents had it in the house. But I remember, as some of you do, question 136, which was, we had to memorize the Baltimore Catechism when I was a kid. Did you have to do that, Dan, when you were a kid? Not the Baltimore, all right, we have to talk after it. I'm going to get you a copy of the Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> And you're much younger than I am anyway, so that's probably why. Question 136 goes like this. What is a sacrament? And all of you who remember the answer, say it with me. A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Very good, very good. So we older folk have good memories after all these years. We can remember question 136. All right, let's go through that. Let's just rehearse that a little bit. A sacrament, number one, is an outward sign. What does that mean exactly? Well, it can mean different things. But keep this in mind. A sign is something that points to something else, isn't it? So when you see a sign, words are signs, by the way. The very words that are coming out of my mouth are, are verbal signs for the concepts that they're describing. If I say the word lasagna, that's a sign pointing toward a reality that you may have had for dinner last night, right? Lasagna. So the word lasagna is simply a sign. It's pointing to the reality. It's, you can't eat the word. You can't, you know, cut the word lasagna up and, and digest that. But you know what lasagna itself is. So we have many different kinds of signs. If you were to be well, actually, we were just watching a bit of the news before dinner this evening. There was a news story about some big column of smoke in San Francisco. I was in San Francisco yesterday, and I didn't see that, probably because there was so much fog. But I imagine it must have been kind of startling. A burning, a burning building was causing all this smoke. So if you were to see a column of smoke like that rising up in the distance, what would that be a sign to you of? Fire, right, okay. So how about this? You're driving along and then all of a sudden some flashing red lights start going off behind you. That's a sign of what? There's a lot of answers going on. Speeding, talking on your cell phone, not bubbled up. Okay. But that's a sign that you're probably in trouble. That maybe your insurance rates are about to go up. Uh, if, uh, if you see somebody, let's say that the, the policeman, it, he pulls over a motorist, and as he leans into the 
into the car to get the license and registration, and he smells the smell of alcohol, that's a sign that the motorist is intoxicated. So we can go on giving examples, flashing red lights signifying danger, smoke signifying fire, the word lasagna signifying the meal that you would eat. We can go on and on giving examples. That's what we mean by sign. And that's what the church means when she says that, number one, the sacraments are an outward sign. So let's keep that fixed in our mind, first of all. They actually symbolize something. One thing I should add to this before I proceed is the fact that some people mistakenly think of the sacraments as if, well, you Catholics think they're literal, we think they're symbolic, as if it's either or. Have you ever heard that kind of language from somebody? You think it's literal, we think it's symbolic. You should correct them and say, no, no, no. As a Catholic, we believe that they are both literal and symbolic. Sacraments are symbolic. They do symbolize. They are signs, but they're more than signs. Okay, that's point number one. So let's rehearse one more time. Sacrament is an outward sign. Next, instituted by Christ. What does that mean exactly? Well, the Catholic Church says that as Jesus was healing and preaching and teaching and casting out demons and instructing the apostles what they should do after he left, that there were certain significant events in which Jesus instituted or inaugurated a sacrament. And we see this variously in the Gospels in places such as in John chapter 1. And in, that is, by the way, paralleled in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where Jesus is baptized in the river Jordan. And what happened at that baptism? Remember, St. John the Baptist was baptizing before Jesus came into the public view. He was baptizing a baptism of repentance, right? So it was a baptism very similar to the sacrament of baptism, but he couldn't actually do what it symbolized. But when he saw Jesus, as he himself says in John chapter 1, he said, when I saw him, I said, there is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. World. And the description of the baptism of the Lord includes the fact that when he went down into the water to be baptized, that the voice of God the Father could be heard from the heavens saying, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. And he said, Lord, that this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. And there was also the form of the Holy, excuse me, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that could be seen in the air above Jesus. So several things are happening. Jesus is being baptized. The voice of the Father is speaking from heaven. And the Holy Spirit is manifested in the form of a dove. These are all signs. And Jesus inaugurated the sacrament of baptism at that moment. So although he himself, being sinless, did not need to be baptized, there was no purpose for him individually to be baptized, except for baptism needed to become the sacrament as opposed to the only the sign that what that's what St. John the Baptist was doing. He was giving only a sign. He was baptizing with water symbolically, but when Jesus himself was baptized, the sacrament of baptism was inaugurated. So he established the sacrament then and there. Or how about the Holy Eucharist? I'm sure you all know exactly where this takes place. In the Gospels, we see at the Last Supper, Jesus, very much the way we see the priest at Mass, he took the elements of bread and the chalice of wine, and he pronounced the words over them, this is my body, which will be given up for you, and this is the chalice of my blood, which will be poured out for many. And then he concluded by telling the apostles, do this in memory of me. And even that very statement included a kind of Old Testament, almost a kind of sacramental dimension, because it, it harkened back to when God told Moses, during the time that he gave Moses the, uh, the commandments about how you have to slaughter certain kinds of animals as ritual sacrifices, turtle doves, uh, sheep, and specifically lambs, also bulls and various other animals, and the command was, you must do this. In fact, King David uh, is, uh, is recorded as saying, I will do the bulls in the morning. And that is a kind of a sacramental word, meaning that I will sacrifice them. I will do what God has commanded me to do in the 
this liturgical, quasi-effective uh, way that the Old Testament sacrifices uh, were enjoined upon the people to be. So all of these instances that we see of Jesus instituting the sacraments, and we'll go through as time permits some of the other examples of that, these, and this is why this point is so important, these are not things that the church herself created. The seven sacraments are given to us by Christ himself. It's not the Pope. It's not the Council. It's not Father Jeffrey Keyes or Scott Hahn or anyone else who says these are the things that you should do because they're nice and they're really fancy rituals and people will really get into the spectacle. No. It's because Jesus instituted them and gave them to the church. Now what's the third point? So the sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ. Third part, that gives grace. And here's what that means. It means that God operates through the medium of physical things to impart spiritual blessings. Some people might look at that statement and say, I don't believe that. Spirit is one thing, matter is another. How can a piece of bread affect my soul? If, in fact, by the way, that's just a piece of bread, which we don't believe it is. But he might say, how can water be poured on a baby's head regenerate the soul? And I think that's a fair question. Because we can look at material things and say, spirit, matter, there, there's a, a great gulf in between. And how can we honestly, rationally think that water poured over someone's head can actually take away sin? Okay, fair question. Let me ask you this. When you had a long day at work or school, or you're not feeling well, or you're stressed out, maybe you're afraid of something, or you know, who knows whatever the thing is, do you have your own personally favorite kind of comfort food that you like? Popcorn, ice cream, mashed potatoes, and uh, meatloaf with gravy? That sounds pretty good. Um, any of the above, uh, dare I say, a whole pan of brownies, maybe if things are really stressful. And you know what it is, that comfort food. We all do. For some people, their comfort food is liquid. It may not be food, it might be beer, it might be some other form of alcohol. But here's why I'm bringing this up. Is it not true that the comfort food affects your mood? It does, doesn't it? Now this is at a very low level that we're talking about here, but your mood is purely immaterial. Your mood can be affected by your bodily circumstances, but your mood is an emotion, your emotion is immaterial. It's part of the spiritual dimension of you as a person. But food can actually affect that. It can make you feel better, you can have a sense of well-being. So if we think about that as kind of a low level interaction between matter and spirit, then we can step it up when we say, in the sacraments, Jesus actually gives us grace because he is in the sacrament. He is the one who accomplishes in the soul of the person receiving the sacrament. He accomplishes what's being symbolized. So in the case of baptism, when it, whether it's a baby or somebody a little bit older, when that person is being baptized, it is not the minister, the priest, or the deacon, or the bishop, or any of those people who might be doing the baptism who are actually making this change take effect. But rather, it's Jesus in the sacrament who is causing this profound change to take place. It's symbolized by the water being poured, or if the person is being immersed, but it's actually accomplished. Now, this leads us to a time-honored phrase in Catholic theology. You probably have heard it at least one time or another, and that's ex opere operato. And you can impress your friends at the next dinner party that you attend. By the way, did you know that the sacraments are ex opere operato? What that means in Latin is from the work worked. And it's another way of saying that by the very action of the priest at Mass, saying the words of consecration, for example, over the bread and the wine. Or uh, at baptism, when the deacon pours the water over the head of the baby, or the person is immersed into the water, both forms are valid. That by the very action of doing this, saying the words and performing the action, 
the reaction or the accomplishing effect takes place. So let's consider what those things are. Let's look at the sacrament of baptism, which by the way, did you know this? That the sacrament of baptism is a sacrament that no Christian is allowed to receive. Think about that. I'm glad that some of you said, what? Think about that for a minute. No Christian is allowed to receive that sacrament. The reason is because that's how you become a Christian. Now, I don't mean that you might have some affinity for Jesus Christ, or you might have some belief in Jesus Christ. That's good. And that's, you might say, kind of the threshold of coming into the body of Christ. But to really become a Christian, the Bible way, is to be baptized. In John chapter 3, when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and Jesus says to Nicodemus, uh, I tell you, unless you are born from above, you will have, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, you will not have life in you. Nicodemus says, how can that be? How, how can a man be born again? It's interesting that Nicodemus uses the phrase born again. Jesus says born from above. And there is kind of a play on words in the Greek term there, anothen, which can be understood as above, or it can be understood as again. But Nicodemus misunderstands him, and he thinks that Jesus means that a fully grown man or woman would somehow have to get back inside the womb of the mother who gave birth to that person, and then be born all over again, which is, of course, an impossibility. And Jesus points it out. He says, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, unless you are born of water and the Holy Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then it begins to dawn on Nicodemus that this sacrament is something that symbolizes in a certain way the fact that in a, in a natural way, we are born to our mothers. We, we come out of our mother's bodies alive and we can live on our own. And in a certain kind of analogous way, when we are baptized, we have something similar but far better in the sense that we go from having a soul that is inert. The word inert there referring to that it's lifeless. It's like a car that's turned off. Or you might even think of it almost like a car with no engine. It's inert. It's just going to sit there. It can't do what cars are made to do. But if the, if the car, if, if, let's just say it has an engine, if the car is turned on, then the car is no longer inert. The car can then drive around and do what cars are designed to do, which is to move around on the highways and byways of the roadways. And in the same kind of way, the soul of the person before baptism is inert. It is missing something that Adam and Eve lost for all of us, and that is the sanctifying grace. This is why we talk about original sin. Original sin is not a sin that any baby committed. Babies can't commit sins. Certainly babies in the womb before they're born, they can't defend God. Their will is not engaged to the point that they can decide, much less understand, what is true, what is false, what is good, what is bad. So they can't rebel against God and commit a sin. But yet, all of us are conceived in the condition of original sin. It's kind of like, imagine for a minute, imagine like a, a wingless eagle. That would be rather disturbing, wouldn't it? If you saw an eagle that was a mutant and had no wings. Because eagles, in order to fulfill their identity as eagles, as birds, they need wings so they can fly. If they don't have wings, they can't fly. If they can't fly, they're not really, they can't live out their purpose. And in a strange kind of way, that's the tragedy of the fall of Adam and Eve. That is that all of the human race now, we're like wingless eagles. We are, we, we are born in a condition where we're missing something. That's why we feel bad for people who don't have their eyesight, or people who are deaf, or have some other type of disability where something that should be there, like sight or hearing or speech, is missing. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas called a privation of a do good. What that means is not to do good things, but do, D-U-E. It, it should be there. It's due to that person, but it's missing. So baptism, number one, 
It takes us out of that condition of original sin by restoring the very thing that is missing, which is sanctifying grace. How could Adam and Eve have done that to all of us, some people ask themselves. Well, it's not unlike the mother and the father who have accumulated a vast fortune, and then they blow it all gambling. Or maybe they commit some crime, and they get arrested, and that vast fortune is now confiscated from them. Their kids don't get their rightful inheritance because of what mom and dad did. And we're in that very same situation. We don't receive the thing that God intended for us to receive, sanctifying grace. Baptism restores that. It makes us children of, of the Father, so we're no longer runaways, we're no longer orphans. We now have uh, a right relationship with God. And furthermore, the sacrament of baptism, because Christ is working in it, it actually completely eradicates any actual sin that may have been committed by somebody who is above the age of reason, or at least at the age of reason. Any venial sins, any mortal sins, those things are entirely eradicated, entirely forgiven, and also all the effects due to those sins are also removed. So baptism is a powerful sacrament, and without it, we can't receive any of the other sacraments. Which is why I said, kind of trying to be a bit tricky there, that's why I said that no Christian can receive the sacrament because once you receive it, then you are a Christian. And if you receive that sacrament, then you are capable of receiving any or all of the other sacraments. Let's work our way forward. The next sacrament of initiation, typically, would be the sacrament of, Congress, excuse me, of confession. Now when I say typically, what I mean is the way most people receiving the sacraments receive it, the next one they would receive would be the sacrament of confession. And this sacrament restores to life those who have especially fallen into the state of, of serious sin. Serious sin or mortal sin, as the Bible calls it in 1 John chapter 5, is the sin that actually cuts off the life of grace in the soul. And so, Jesus, establishing the sacrament in John chapter 20, verses 18 and forward, he says to the apostles, he breathes on them first of all, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. He who sins you, you forgive are forgiven, and he who sins you hold bound are held bound. Or he also, in some verses, or some translation, he says, those who sins you retain are retained. And he's giving them the authority to forgive sins, but notice that he doesn't give them the authority to read minds. So the assumption here is that when the apostles are going to forgive someone's sins, and since most of our sins are internal, most of the time, the sins we commit, unless you're like robbing a liquor store, or hitting someone over the head with a lead pipe, or something that other people can see and say, oh look at him, he's committing a sin. Most of our sins are interior, aren't they? Our pride, our lust, our covetousness, our anger, all, all those things that we can sin even grievously in are very often, most of the time, they're hidden. So the implication here in John chapter 20 is that the apostles would be able to forgive sins only if the person who committed the sins identified what they are to the apostle. There is, by the way, one exemption to this situation, and that is found in Acts chapter 5, where St. Peter had a special gift of reading souls, at least in this one instance. And there's a married couple who comes to him promising that they have donated all their money to the church, when in fact they had actually kept some of it back for themselves. And they're lying about it. This is Ananias and Sapphira. And so Peter, he kind of quizzes them and he says, are you sure you're, you've given all the money to the church? And they persist in their lie and were told that they were actually struck dead on the spot. So when you discover at some point, given his great holiness, that Father Jeffrey Keyes has the gift of reading souls, <laughs> you better pray that he did not get that gift too, because uh, you know, when, there, when the great saints who hear confessions like St. Padre Pio and other great saints like that, they always heard people's confessions as a way to help them get out of that state of serious sin. Because as we all know, mortal sin is a condition that will lead people straight to hell. So that sacrament often is the sacrament next received. Then confirmation. Now, in the case of an adult convert to the church, it would be first the, the baptism, then 
uh, the Holy Eucharist, and then confirmation. But in the order that we normally receive it, it would be baptism, confession, Holy Eucharist, confirmation. So they're slightly a bit out of order. Let's talk a little bit about the Eucharist for a few minutes. In a way, it's kind of it's kind of difficult to describe a sacrament that all of us in this room, if not if not all of us, then certainly most of us, are used to receiving on a regular basis. But let me approach it from a somewhat different angle. The Holy Eucharist is like, I think, it's like music. And here's what I mean. Let me draw an analogy for you. Picture somebody who wants to start a symphony orchestra. And he gathered, yeah, what is the symphony orchestra anyway? It's a collection, a large collection of highly trained musicians, right? That's what a symphony orchestra is composed of. So let's say, let's say Father Jeff Keyes, just to pick on him a little bit further, if I can forgive me for that. Let's say that he wants to start a symphony orchestra. Now he's an accomplished musician himself, so he's got the ability to do this if he really wanted to. And imagine that he goes around choosing all the different musical instrument parts and the people who play those, and he assembles them, 30, 40, 50 people, however many it might be. And he says, all right, you are now the such and such symphony orchestra, and I want you to go out into the world, and I want you to fill concert halls wherever you go, and get large numbers of people in the concert halls, and I want you to describe music to I want you to tell them what music would sound like if only they could hear it. I want you to go into all the aspects of music. You can give them books about music. You can give lectures about music. And I want you to do everything you can to explain to them what music is all about. Now, you would probably look at Father and say, wait a minute, that's not very interesting. That's not very good. In fact, that's not what a symphony orchestra is decided to do. So the alternative to that would be if he were to start a symphony orchestra. In the first case, he got this group together and he didn't give them any instruments. So there are no horns or cellos or violins or kettle drums or any of the other instruments that are available in a typical symphony orchestra. He just said, I want you to all go out and talk about music. But in the second example, he actually not only gathers the musicians together, but he gives them the instruments. Then he says, now I want you to go out and make music. Play music. Let them hear music. That's what a symphony orchestra is designed to do. Now my thesis, and perhaps this might be helpful to you when you're talking about why we have sacraments, is because the Lord Jesus Christ is like that conductor who forms in the church the very people that he wants to go out to the whole world and not talk about music, not pass out books about music or to describe music. He wants them to play music. And the analogy here is that the music is the Eucharist. The orchestra is the church. The instruments are like unto the mass. This is one thing that we as Catholics should not only recognize, but be joyful and excited and willing to talk to other people about. And that is that in the Catholic Church, you're not just going to hear about Jesus. You're not just going to hear talks and sermons about Him. You're not just going to read books about Him. In the Eucharist, you're actually going to receive Him. Body, blood, soul, and divinity under the appearances of bread and wine. That, to me, is a profoundly beautiful, profoundly compelling reality. And going back to the figure about being beggars on top of Fort Knox, what I mean is, is it not true? Is it not true that many Catholics nowadays, present company accepted, of course, but is it not true that many Catholics nowadays have lost pretty much any sense of Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist? And, and there's no real sense of a burning desire to receive the Lord in the Holy Eucharist because for many, they have become so conditioned to think of the Eucharist as really not much more than just a symbol. And I've even met people who are Catholic, maybe you know some too, who are quite honestly surprised when I explain to them, no, this is not just a, not just a symbol. 
This really is Jesus. Really him under the appearance of bread and wine. It can come as a shock to some people because they were never taught that. And you and I are members of that symphony orchestra. So we have an obligation before the Lord to go out and make that music and help people see these things. I'll tell you a quick story, something that happened to me that had a big effect on me. I was speaking at a parish in San Diego years ago, and when I was finished, I was actually speaking at the, at the Ambo, and when I was finished, um, I got my materials and I genuflected to the tabernacle, and then I walked to the back of the church where a Mormon gentleman had been waiting there. He wanted to talk to me about some of the things that came up in that talk. During the break before it ended, he told me he wanted to have a word afterward. So I walked him back, and there he was. And he asked me, he says, why did you do that little curtsy thing that you did up there? Where you sort of, you know, what was that? What was that? And I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to explain to this Mormon guy all about the sacraments. So I, you know, I felt very, uh, you know, professorial as I said to him, well, we believe that Jesus is truly present in the Blessed Sacrament. And so we genuflect, that's what we call that, dipping down on one knee, and we genuflect to show respect to the Lord, and that's what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I, I thought it might be helpful for him to understand that, but I wasn't prepared for his reaction. He was very thoughtful for a moment, and then he turned and he looked at me and he said, well, I've heard that before. In fact, I've actually even attended a Catholic wedding or two where Mass was celebrated. But he said, I don't really think the Catholics I know believe that. And I said, well, why do you say that? He says, well, because some of the masses that I've been at, Catholics, they, you know, like I could see them not really paying attention. He said some, one time he saw someone chewing gum, going up to receive communion, took the gum out of his mouth, received communion. I don't know if he popped the gum back in. It's a horrible thought, but this Mormon guy is telling me this. And he said, Personally speaking, if I believed what you Catholics believe, I would be flat on my face adoring God in, the, in what you call the, the Eucharist. I don't believe that's really what it is. But if I did, I would be flat on my face adoring God. And I don't see Catholics doing that. Therefore, I don't think Catholics really believe what you're talking about. Now, that was a real blow to my ego, number one. But it was also a great reminder to me of how we Catholics can actually anti-evangelize people. You know, we can evangelize them by, by giving them edifying examples of reverence for the Lord, but we can also push people further away from the truth if we don't do a good job of showing our respect for the Lord. I'm a big believer in showing more respect rather than less. If we're going to make a mistake, let's make a mistake in the direction of showing more respect rather than less respect. That's my thought. Let's talk for a minute. Uh, about the Eucharist itself. Some people, they, they have difficulty with the fact that, well, when I come up to receive Holy Communion, it still tastes like bread. And the wine still tastes like wine. Have any of you maybe ever wondered in the back of your minds if the person who received from the chalice before you had uh, the flu or a cold, would the fact that this is Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, would that keep you immune? from the flu bug, if you were to receive right after that person, and now you drank that flu bug into your, I know I'm not using medical terminology, the, the physicians have to explain to me the correct terms, but you know what I mean. Uh, some people I know, they think, well, that could never happen because this is the consecrated body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, therefore I could never get sick. And that's actually not the case. And here's why. The sacraments, and we're going to talk here just for a moment about the Holy Eucharist, they are those outward signs that actually convey grace. And in the case of the matter of the sacraments, the Eucharistic matter particularly, we have bread and wine. Now in the Latin rite, the Western rite that we are all in, or most of us anyway are in, uh, the valid matter for the sacrament of the Eucharist is unleavened wheat bread. It can't be mixed with sugar or salt or peanut butter. It can't have sprinkles or butterscotch chips in it. It can't have anything else. It can only be unleavened wheat bread. Baked, not fried or anything else. It's got to be baked. 
They're very simple, and, and that's the valid matter. Anything that is used instead of that, a potato chip, a peanut butter cookie, a piece of tofu, uh, whatever it is that you might imagine, not, not, nothing else other than unleavened wheat bread would be a valid sacramental bread for the Holy Eucharist. So that's point number one. And in the case of the wine, it has to be actual wine. It can have a lower or even a very low amount of alcohol, but it can't be grape juice. It can't be some other type of simulation of wine. It certainly must be great wine. It can't be whiskey, it can't be beer, it can't be vodka or sake or any other kind of alcoholic drink you might be able to imagine. It has to be great wine. The reason is because those are the elements that the Lord himself chose at the Last Supper. And, the, and Jesus said to the apostles, do this, not something else, do this, okay? What we're looking at there are two realities. The first is what we call the accidents of the sacraments. And the, accident, the word accident doesn't mean like two cars crashing together. It means the external characteristics. So the, the touch, the texture, the taste, the molecular structure of the bread, the alcoholic effect of the wine, the liquidity, the color, all those things are all the external characteristics. And let's just use a, this as a thought experiment, if, if we can, to make this point. Uh, those are the outward characteristics, but they're not the actual thing itself. And here's how we can think about that. Imagine if I had a white styrofoam cup in my hand here, the kind we would have on a picnic. And is the white of the cup the cup? No? You're right. If you said no, you're right. The white color of the cup is not the cup itself, is it? Is the, the texture of the styrofoam, the smoothness and the sponginess of that, is that the cup? No. Is the weight of the cup the cup? No. Is the, even the shape of the cup, the shape itself, is that the cup? No. The taste is not the cup, the feel, how it looks, none of those things is actually the cup. Those are all external characteristics of the cup. The essence, and that's the word that theologians use to describe the reality of the cup, is seen by all those external characteristics. And so at, at the Holy Eucharist, what happens at Mass is that those external characteristics of bread and wine are bread and wine, in fact, before the consecration. But at the moment of consecration, the miracle of transubstantiation occurs, and the substance or the reality of the bread and the wine vanish and are replaced by the, the reality of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. They are now there under the appearance of bread and wine. So if you were to bring, if you were to drink enough of this of the precious blood, you could become inebriated. Because those external characteristics still remain. Uh, you could catch a flu bug, for example. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to discourage you from receiving Holy Communion. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying these are some of the aspects of that. And the great miracle is that we are receiving the risen Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under these humble, uh, these humble elements of bread and wine. I've had some people say to me, well, that is just too much for me to accept that God could come to me in the form of a wafer or in the form of a cookie. I've heard some people talk about it that way, which is really makes my hair stand on end. Um, I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, I was, I was, when I was dating this Protestant girl in high school, her father was a very devout Protestant, and he really disliked the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist. He one day gave me a copy of a chick comic book tract called The Death Cookie. Maybe you've heard of this before. You've seen these little fundamentalist tracts. They, they are aimed at trying to disprove Catholic teachings. So the death cookie was his uh, effort to show me that Catholic teaching on the Eucharist was paganism and that we were worshiping a piece of bread. Now, let's think of it. If her father, this girl's father that gave me this tract, if he was right, then we would be idolaters. As Catholics. Let's think about that for a minute. If at Mass we approach to receive what is only a piece of bread, then we would be blaspheming God because we'd be worshiping a piece of bread. But if, on the other hand, 
the Catholic Church's teaching is true, and this really is the Lord Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under the appearance of bread and wine, then not only are we not doing anything wrong, we are actually doing the very thing that Jesus commanded us to do in John chapter 6, when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He says, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. And when he said, at the, at the, toward the very end of the Bread of Life discourse, uh, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and truth. Sometimes people will look at that and say, well, oh, that means symbolic. When Jesus says these are spiritual words, not carnal or not fleshly words, that means he's speaking symbolically. Well, you can respond to that by saying, well, that doesn't really follow, does it? Because Jesus himself, he revealed to us God who is pure spirit. Now, God is not a symbol. God is real. Our souls are spirits. They're not symbolic. They're real. Or the angels. They're not symbolic. They're real. The word spirit doesn't mean symbolic. It just means immaterial. It doesn't take up space. So as we kind of wend our way through the sacraments, all of them, the Holy Eucharist, confession, confirmation, where we become adults in Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in a particular way. That sacrament, by the way, was established on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in the form of tongues of flame. The apostles received the sacrament of holy orders at the Last Supper, when they were ordained by Jesus. There were actually a twofold uh, inauguration of sacraments at the Last Supper, the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood. And that is something to keep in mind that you can't have one without the other. The church would not have a valid Eucharist if it did not have validly ordained priests, nor could we have validly ordained priests who did nothing or who did things other than celebrate the Eucharist and never celebrate the Eucharist. The two go hand in hand. Uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony, how the two people, man and woman, are made, they are joined together in the image of Christ and the church. The sacrament of holy anointing, in which Jesus commanded the apostles to go forth and to anoint people with oil and cast out demons and proclaim the gospel to them. All of these different sacraments, to harken back to that opening statement, are those outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace. And I'll conclude with this final thought. In your discussions with your non-Catholic friends, the folks that you know in your own families who have left the church, I have to think that many of them left because they never knew these things. They never understood these things. And their rejection is based on a kind of well-meaning, sincere ignorance, not because they thought things through and decided, you know, I really don't believe that, I'm not going to accept it. Which is why it's so important for you and for me as Catholics to take the, this information and to explain it to other people in a way that they can understand so that we can help draw them back to the house of the Father. So that we can share with them the riches that we have, the graces that we receive through the sacraments that Jesus wants us all to enjoy so that we can get to heaven. This is a very important thing and per perhaps it's the most important reason for giving this talk so that all of us can not only rethink these truths in our own minds and consider them afresh, but also have a greater sense of confidence so that when we go forth to talk to other people, we will realize that I'm not just saying this because that's what I was taught, I really do believe this. I really believe that Christ is in the Eucharist. I'll finish with this thought. Just taking the Eucharist itself. If that is just a piece of bread and the Catholic Church is wrong, then let's all go home. Father, uh, Father Keys, you can just lock up the church, turn off the lights, and uh, go find a new career. Because if Jesus is not truly present in the Blessed Sacrament, this is all a sham. And I would argue that not only is the Catholic Church false, if that's the case, but all of Christianity is false. Because Christianity historically has always held this doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The early martyrs died for this truth. But if it's true, then not only should we be receiving the sacraments with as much fervor as we possibly can, but I would argue that everyone in the world should be Catholic. Don't you think? 
I mean, if Jesus is truly present here in the Blessed Sacrament, then this is for everybody, and we should do our part in trying to help them come home. Thank you very much for your kind attention.